Y'all don't usually see me when I'm reading this book, but started to change it up a little. Chapter 7, Descent into Hell. Calvary must have had an immediate and tremendous effect upon that spirit world, the full extent and nature of which we may not yet know. W. Graham Scroggy. One would hardly expect the Apostles' Creed, composed in the early Christian era, to refer to the Nephilim. Such a document seems far removed from the events of Genesis 6. But let's take a look. The Apostles' Creed is a distillation of doctrine abbreviated down to an irreducible minimum. Because a creed demands such condensation, many a truth has to be omitted, and only major cardinal truths are included. In the Apostles' Creed, truths about our Lord's teachings, preachings, miracles, have been omitted, and so has all reference to the events of Pentecost. Yes. Not that many, not that these were unimportant. It was that the creed formulators had to be prestigiously selective. A truth had to be absolutely paramount to gain admittance into this creed. Where does this lead us? To the all-important question of our study. Does the Apostles' Creed contain any reference to Genesis 6 and to the Nephilim? It certainly does. On the surface, it may not be all that apparent, but it is there. Embedded in the Creed is an article which received but scant attention from modern preachers and professors. It could well be called the Forgotten Article. It reads, he descended into hell. In the three day interval before his death, between his death and resurrection, Christ went to hell to fulfill a specific mission. Oh, fucks. Admittedly, this particular article does not appear in the earlier forms of the Apostles' Creed. However, it was an integral art of the apostle, apostles' beliefs and was later included in the creed itself. The point we are making is that the inclusion of this particular article, he descended into hell, had to be of special significance indeed. As special as that of the virgin birth, the cross, the resurrection, the second advent. It is thus all the more surprising that this truth is rarely discussed. Any more rare still is it preached, and still rarer does anyone sing about it. It was not always so. In the 1641 prayer book, there is included the Stern Holden Hopkins version of the Psalms, and in it we read, His soul did after this descend into the lower parts, a dread unto the wicked spirits, but joy to faithful hearts. The biblical passage that sheds most light on this article is 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might also bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient. When once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was prepare, a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Interestingly, this is the passage designated in the prayer book to be read on Easter Eve, coinciding perfectly with biblical chronology. And for the morning of the same day, the designated reading was Zechariah 9, which speaks of the pit wherein is no water and of the prisoners of hope. Interpretations. Numerous and varied attempts have been made to interpret this passage from Peter. It is doubtful if any passage in the Bible has had more interpretations. Some have interpreted it as a warrant for purgatory, some as a warrant for universalism, claiming release for prisoners of all time, some as a warrant for the release of those prisoners who were in hell at that particular time and referred to as the harrowing of hell. Some as a probationary period for immature saints. But all of these theories run contrary to the testimony of scripture. Nowhere are we taught that the saints have to go through a process of purging and purifying before gaining admission to heaven. 
Man enters heaven not by the slow, purifying process of purgatory which he endures, but by being made acceptable to God in the perfection of Christ who endured on his behalf. To argue universalism on the basis of this text is not only to deny the testimony of other passages of Scripture, John 8.24, Hebrews 9.27, but is, it is to deny the purpose of Christ in coming to the world. Obviously, these theories do not interpret the text. What then is its meaning? What does the Bible mean when it declares that Christ descended to preach unto the spirits in prison? 1 Peter 3.19 Here again we are presented with a variety of interpretations, even among evangelicals. Calvin dismisses this passage with a general comment that Christ descended into hell in order to complete his vicarious suffering. By going there he endured for a few brief hours the torments of the lost. It was a part of what Calvin called the horrible Agoste. But this interpretation sheds no light on the reference to Noah, nor on why should Christ preach in hell. Some interpret the passage as meaning that Christ went to preach to all the Old Testament dead, and that those who were disobedient in Noah's day were representative of all others. But the passage simply does not say this. Some suggest that Christ actually preached in the days of Noah to the spirits who were afterwards confined to prison. Again, conjecture. Augustine's theory was somewhat similar. He stated that Christ preached in the spirit in the days of Noah, just as he preached in the flesh in the days of Galilee. But if such were the case, it still does not shed light on the descent into hell. In the same vein, others theorize that the reference has nothing at all to do with the Lord's action between his death and resurrection. Nor, as a matter of fact, does it refer to the days of Noah. Rather, it refers to the preaching of the apostles after the resurrection of Christ. Frankly, we fail to see the connection. It is obvious that all these so-called explanations have a lot of questions to be answered. Who are these spirits in prison? Why were they there? Why specifically those of Noah's day? What exactly did Christ preach to them? Peter's motives. Before beginning to answer each question individually, it is essential to know what the motives of Peter in writing this letter were. We know that he refers to Christ preaching unto the spirits in prison. But how does this fit in with the total message of the letter? Fortunately, Peter's message and motive is crystal clear. It is to encourage the saints who were suffering persecution for their faith. The letter abounds with references to them. They are the elect of God, scattered by a terrible persecution, unleashed upon them by the Roman emperor. They have become targeted for special treatment during the reign of Nero in AD 64-68. It proved to be one of the fiercest and cruelest persecutions in the history of the church. Peter is concerned about the saints who have been dispersed and scattered throughout the empire and writes this letter to encourage their hearts and strengthen their faith. That the trial of your faith be much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1 7. Beloved, Think it not strange the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange things happen unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. 1 Peter 4, 12-13 Reign of Terror There is no doubt about the fiery element. This is exactly what awaited some of the saints at the hands of Nero. He used them as flaming torches to illuminate his gardens at night, referred to by Roman historians as flammati. Tacticus records, their sufferings were at the execution were aggravated by the insult and mockery, for some were disguised in the skins of the wild beast and worried by dogs. Some were crucified, and others were wrapped in pitched shirts and set on fire when the day closed, that they might serve as lights to illuminate the night. That is a sick, twisted, psychotic individual, sociopath, whatever, that would even do this to anyone. Juvenile writes, In the same vein, burning in their own flame and smoke, their head being held up by a stake fixed to their chin, till they made a long stream of blood and sulfur on the ground. 
sickening. Nero was one sick, twisted dude. Peter underscores the same message in chapter 3 of his letter. He tells them not to be afraid of this terror, but to rejoice because they are suffering for, the, for righteousness sake. After all, it is better to suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. 1 Peter 3.17 then he reminds them of what happened to the Savior himself. He too suffered, the just for the unjust. And then comes the thrust of his whole message. Note what happened to Jesus afterwards. After he suffered and was put to death in the flesh, he was quickened by the Spirit. King James reference version. Or in the Spirit, New American Standard, 1 Peter 3.18. He exchanged the flesh by which alone he could suffer for a glorious spiritual body which can neither suffer nor die. Then came the descent into hell, followed by the resurrection and then the ascension. Christ is now gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. 1 Peter 3.22 The same thing will happen to his followers who are suffering and even being martyred for their faith. They too have been begotten unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you 1 Peter 1 3 through 4 this is the whole purpose for Peter's letter to comfort and encourage the persecuted saints by depicting the glory to come there is a resurrection awaiting them their death will issue in victory and triumph just as it did in the case of Jesus as for Jesus he tells them his triumph was such that he went and announced it to the spirits in the prison. To understand what exactly is meant by this statement, preaching unto the spirits in prison, it is necessary to examine the three major words used by Peter in this text. Preach, spirits, prison. Preach. We normally associate preaching with proclaiming the gospel, but actually this is to put a limitation on the word which it does not have in the original. The Greek word for preach here is caruso and means to herald, to publish, to proclaim. It does not tell us what it is to be herald, published, or proclaimed. There's another Greek word that does that and it is evangelizo. This word means specifically to preach the gospel, the good news, but caruso is different. By itself, it tells nothing of the message to be proclaimed. Kenneth S. Woost in his word studies tells us that the word Caruso in itself gives no indication of the content of the message. A qualifying phrase must be added for that purpose. This is why when the word Caruso is used in the New Testament, there is usually added to it a word like gospel or God. Jesus went all about Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 4.23 we preached unto you the gospel of God, 1 Thessalonians 2.9. The bottom line is, when the word Caruso is used alone, as in 1 Peter 3.19, without any reference to the terms of the proclamation, then in no sense is the gospel or salvation a necessary part of its meaning. Thus, when Jesus went and preached unto the spirits in prison, it did not necessarily mean that he went to preach the gospel to them. It simply meant that he went and announced something to them. What was that something we will become evident as we proceed? It is sufficient to say at this juncture that it was not the gospel, but something of a judgmental nature. Anyway, angels were never included among those for whom the Lord died. Preaching the gospel has no relevance for a congregation of angels. Spirits. Just as the word preach had been has been invariably associated in our thinking with preaching the gospel, so the word spirits has been invariably associated with the spirits of men. But again, this is to assume an association that does not exist. In the original, when the word spirit stands alone, it never signifies men. When it does signify men, there is always added to a further definition, like a qualifying word or clause, e.g. a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination. Acts 16, 16. The spirits of just men made perfect. Hebrews 12, 23. The word spirits, pneumata, by itself, without any qualifying description, is always used of supernatural beings, higher than man and lower than God. 
being they that have no beings that have no corporal garb of flesh and blood or flesh and bones used without a qualifying addition spirits mean supernatural beings e.g. notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven Luke 10 20 spirits here obviously mean demons when the even was come they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils and he cast out these spirits with his word and healed all that were sick Matthew 8 16 now the spirit speaketh inexpressibly expressly that in the latter time shall come to part from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils 1 Timothy 4 1 it is clear that the word spirits is used alone it invariably refers to supernatural beings sometimes good angels sometimes fallen angels there is a specific re reference in Psalm 104.4, who maketh his angels spirits. And the same truth with even greater clarity is found in Acts 8.26 through 39. In verse 26, God's messenger is referred to as the angel of the Lord, but in verse 29 as the spirit. And in verse 39 again as the spirit of the Lord. The word angel and spirit are obviously used interchangeably. Revelation 1-4 speaks of the seven spirits that are before the throne of God, and Revelation 4-5 of the seven spirits of God. These were seven angelic beings standing in special relationship with the Lord. Even more conclusive is the fact that the two words come together in Acts 23-8. The Sadducees, we are told, believe in neither angel nor spirit. Let one more scripture suffice. Paul in a famous passage in 1 Timothy 3.16 writes, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, emphasis added. A superior translation would be beheld by angels, New American Standard, or seen by angels, New International Version. But when was he seen by angels? During the three days when he preached to the spirits in prison. In answer to the question, who are these spirits, Kenneth S. Wust says, they cannot be human beings. The word pneuma is used as a designation of just two classes of free moral agents in the New Testament, of angels, Hebrews 1, 7 and 14, and of demons, Matthew 8, 16, Luke 10, 17, 20. It is interesting to observe how the apostles complement each other. The Apostle Paul tells us that Christ appeared to angels, 1 Timothy 3.16. The Apostle Peter, why and where Christ appeared to angels, 1 Peter 3.19 and 2 Peter 2.4. And the Apostle Jude, why the angels were there in the first place, Jude 6 and 7. It is obvious that not all fallen angels have been incarcerated to prison, or else there would be no demons free today to afflict the human race. God incarcerated only those angels who had been disobedient in the days of Noah i.e. those angels who had sinned with the women of earth and by so doing had corrupted and tainted the human seed. In other words, the clue to the meaning of the article in the Apostles' Creed is 1 Peter 3.19 and the clue 1 Peter 3.19 is Genesis 6. Prison One author has drawn attention to the fact that the word prison received emphatic prominence in the original structure of this verse. Coming at the end, it signifies, even to the spirits in prison, as if it were a news event of unusual significance, that Christ should have this proclamation in the prison itself, even there. Do we have any information as to the location of the prison? Peter in 2 Peter 2.4 uses the Greek word Tartarus, the only time it is used in scripture, and used, let it be noted, with reference to fallen angels and not fallen men. The word has been variously translated in our English versions. The NEB gives us the dark pits of hell, the RV pits of darkness, the NIV gloomy dungeons. One translator renders it the vilest province of hell. In all these translations, depth and darkness are the distinctiveness of Tartarus. When Homer used the word, he gave it the meaning of subterranean. Hades was the place where the souls of departed men awaited the oncoming judgment. But Tartarus was a much deeper and darker abyss and reserved specifically for fallen angels. One is reminded of the lines of Milton, and in the lowest deep, still threatening to devour me, opens wide. 
Similarly, the book of Enoch 22.2 reserves Tartarus for these same fallen angels. In view of all this, how does one interpret 1 Peter 3.19? It, <laughs> it is obvious that we cannot adopt the popular but erroneous interpretation, declaring Christ went to Hades to preach the gospel to the spirits of men who had sinned in the days of Noah, intending to extend them another chance. This view is in no way fits the purpose of the letter, which was to encourage the saints to endure persecution for the Lord's sake. Bullinger states it eloquently. Note the incongruity and inconsequence of the popular explanation, which is to this effect. Christ also suffered, and after he died, he went and preached the gospel to the greatest evildoers the world has ever seen, so great that their sins brought down the judgment of the flood. We ask, what has this to do with the argument of the Holy Spirit in the context? What reason is this? Why is it good to suffer for the Lord's sake? What encouragement is there in this for them or for us to suffer for well-doing? Apart from the inexplicable supposition that these greatest of sinners are singled out for special mercy, this interpretation is really at variance with the argument. It would be indeed rather an argument for evil doing rather than for well-doing. For why should we suffer for well-doing when, even if we do evil, Christ himself gives us hope of salvation after death? It seems clear that such an interpretation of 1 Peter 3.19 does injustice to the meaning of the text, is contrary to the purpose of the letter, and is unscriptural as regards the doctrine it purposes, the triumphant descent. The only interpretation that does justice to all three categories, the meaning of the text, the purpose of the letter, and the doctrine of the scripture, is the one that describes Christ going down to the deepest dungeons of hell, not to preach salvation, to lost men, but rather to proclaim his victory to the fallen angels. That victory had been completed at the cross, and thus the judgment of the angels had been sealed. So complete was that victory that Christ went down even to Tartarus to announce it. So complete was his victory that having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them, openly triumphing over them in it. Colossians 2.15 So complete that angels and authorities and powers have been made subject unto him, so complete that things in heaven, things in earth, and even things under the earth may know forevermore that he is Lord of all. This view has the additional merit of keeping in sequence the whole series of Christ's actions between his death and his ascension. The chronological order is perfect. Put to death in the flesh, went, preached, resurrected, gone into heaven. 1 Peter 3.18-22 But to return to our original quest, the position is this. Down in the dark dungeons of hell are certain fallen angels incarcerated there for a sin they committed back in the days before the flood. Their sin was specifically that of leaving their own habitation, giving themselves over to fornication, and going after strange flesh. In other words, these extraterrestrial beings had lusted after carnal relations with inhabitants of earth. Demonic inbreeding. This specific sin of which these extraterrestrials were guilty must be classified as the most repugnant and repulsive that can meet anywhere in the annals of the human race. It is such an abomination in the sight of the Lord that it called forth the ultimate judgment. No sin ever moved the sovereign Lord of the universe to such unmatched anger and unmitigated wrath, and no sin was ever punished like this one. Its magnitude was such that both parties suffered in the most unusual and devastating manner. Humans by being nearly exterminated in the flood, and angels by being committed to everlasting chains. And what is of frightening import to us is that the same sin may we well be committed again in the last days of planet Earth. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Luke 17:26. But however black this evil was in itself, it was also indicative of an even blacker transgression. It signified nothing less than the total disarray and derangement of the divine plan for the redemption of the human race. If Satan had succeeded in his conspiracy, it would have made the incarnation of Jesus and the atonement of Jesus impossible. Then Christ would not have been able to answer in his humanity to the humanity of man. What is more, God had no plan and has no plan for the redemption of angels. Hebrews 2.16 God's plan was for the seed of Abraham. God bypassed the fallen angels, leaving them chained in Tartarus. But in infinite mercy, he did plan the salvation of fallen man through the vicarious sacrifice of his own son. 
But this whole plan would have been in jeopardy if the human race had become permanently polluted by the inbreeding of demonic agencies from hell.